Hello and welcome to a new episode of Agile TD Mondays. Today, Paul Girard will tell you more about a new model for testing. But before Paul starts, I want to let you know that the Agile Testing Days have a lot to offer this year. For more information, visit agiletestingdays.com and register now. And now to you, Paul. Thanks very much uh, for the intro. Um, firstly, let me thank uh, the Agile Testing Days people uh, and Sabine in particular for asking me to uh, give a webinar on uh, my new model uh, for testing. Um, just uh, before I get started, of the little books that you can see on the right of the picture here, the one that's titled Digital Assurance has a description of the new model. So if you want to read a bit further uh, into this and how it fits into the digital world, uh, you can actually get a free copy of uh, the little book, and I'll show you how to uh, do that at the end of the talk. Okay, let's move on. So my, the, the pretext for having this concept of a new model, a new way of thinking about testing, is it's driven by the need to cope with a whole lot of pressures that have been imposed on testers over the last... I guess 10 or 15 years, but with the advent of digital, the whole uh, context of how we do testing in our uh, software projects is, is going to have to change. And my argument is that with things like uh, DevOps, continuous delivery, test analytics, the shift left, and the move towards pervasive automation, including testing, uh, means that we have to kind of rethink how we approach uh, our testing in these different kinds of projects. Now, Agile brought its own pressures to testers because uh, Agile uh, teams tended not to have a very well-defined role for the testers. So testers kind of thought they were sort of squeezed out a little bit. And the pressure on test managers as well, and in particular test managers, um, it, it seems like the role of test managers is going to have to change quite dramatically and a lot of companies are now having to find new roles, new new activities for their test managers to do. At any rate, um, the pressure on testing and on testers um, is driven by the need to redistribute responsibility for testing. So whether you're shifting responsibility left, getting rid of testers and making developers responsible or embedding testers with uh, developers in Agile or DevOps teams, um, these things are putting pressure on us. So we need a new way of thinking about testing, is my argument. We also need new tools, I have to say. But let me make progress and uh, suggest that the, my, my thesis is we need a new model of testing. What I mean by that is a new way of thinking about testing, free from logistics. And let me explain what logistics are. Logistics are the things that get in the way of our thinking, that clutter our minds, that uh, don't uh, contribute to the way we think about you know, the essence of testing, but things we have to do. So they're kind of um, outside the scope, if you like. Uh, I'll explain precisely what I mean by logistics in, in a moment. I'm going to talk quite a lot about models, and you know, the new model is a model. Okay, So um, let me explain what I think about models and how I think they're relevant to you right now. If you imagine uh, this chap here, he's thirsty and his glass of water is a few steps away. For a person to be able to take a single step, your brain has to understand, if you like, the configuration of all the major bones in your body, all the, you know, the, from your toes up to your hips and shoulders and arms and everything. Beyond that, it needs to understand the angles of all the joints. It needs to understand the tensions in all the muscles that connect those bones together. And when you take a single step, your brain has to send a whole orchestrate, orchestrated set of uh, nerve impulses to a hundred muscles at once, just to take a single step. And it does this second by second, but actually it does it much faster than that. Now, the challenge we have is that uh, the fastest computers in the world are required to drive a robot that has a humanoid kind of way of moving, of walking. But our brains certainly are not as powerful as those. So how do our brains uh, make this magic happen, if you like? Well, we must simplify the problem in some magical way, I guess. And this 
is what I would call a modeling exercise. What our brains do is they model reality and use that model to drive the behavior and the activities in our arms and legs and so on. So models are part of how we are human. They are innate, they're essential, and they are human things. Modeling, although you may not call it that, is what's going on in your head right now. We use models to simplify a problem we have, to understand complexity. So in everything I say in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, you could substitute the word understanding for a model. Now, when we come to test, um, developers, testers, BAs, all the participants in a project have sources of information in order to help them do their job. Now, testers depend on sources, and in particular, we might think our requirements are what helps us to understand what a system should do. So we might use you know, documentation, specs, standards, stories, of course. Now, there might be verbal, verbally communicated knowledge too. So we might stand in front of a whiteboard and sketch out pictures of what the system might do to help us understand. We also have our experience of using similar systems and maybe the old system still exists and we can look at that and consult it and ask what that does. And we have experience of our business processes and our, our, our experience in the past of uh, building and testing software, uh, our intuition, our beliefs, biases, prejudices, all these things are in a big soup of information, sources of information which determine how we think about what a system should do. All of those sources we need to kind of collate, understand and model, if you like, in our minds in order to make progress. Now, one thing I have to say, and you well know in your own projects, is our sources of information, our sources of knowledge are often fallible and incomplete. So let's talk about the model now. What I want to do for the next few minutes is to ask you to almost clear your mind to, uh, if you like, think about the blue pill in uh, the matrix where you free your mind of all the clutter, all the logistical uh, ex excesses that uh, confuse, if you like, our thinking. So the way I'm going to put this uh, in a kind of aggressive way almost is to say, for the next few minutes, I'm going to say, I do not care whether you document your tests or not. I do not care whether you automate your tests, you run them manually, or you use some piece of magic to run them. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care whether you're agile or waterfall or continuous delivery or you're in DevOps or some process that no one has even heard of yet. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant to the way you think about testing. I don't care what business you are in, whether you're in banking or insurance or telecoms or government. It doesn't matter. I don't care what technology you use. It's not relevant to the way you think. So now we've cleared our minds, okay? You have a nice white room to be operating in. And let me give you the message, the mission, if you like, from the top of the mountain. Uh, here, is, here it is, all testing is exploratory. And let me explain this. What we do is we explore our sources of knowledge, uh, documentation, people, past experience, our own intuition and knowledge. We explore these sources and in order to understand the complexity, to understand how a system could or should work, we build mental models, we build test models, we build models, we build our understanding in our minds. Now, when we think we understand what a system should do, we can then use that knowledge, that model, to make selections of tests to create meaningful and useful tests. So the way it works is we explore sources of information to build our understanding using models, and these models, our understanding, informs our testing. That's the kind of the mission statement from the top of the mountain. Let's come halfway down, okay? And I'll explain the two states of mind very broadly that exist. On the left, we have this exploration process where we explore our sources. And what we do is we create test models. And at some point, as we explore, as we read, as we study, as we interview, as we discuss and debate, we form in our minds, and maybe we write it down, but we form in our minds uh, models of our understanding. 
and at some point we think our understanding is okay, it's ready, we, we know what the system should do and we move from the left to the right. We, we use our understanding, we use our models to derive meaningful tests and we run those tests and so on. But what can happen is as we, as we experience how the system under test works, we discover our understanding isn't perfect. We have to go back to the left. Our models are not adequate. We have to go back to the users to ask questions or we reread a requirement or we create some new examples to explore how the system should behave and check with our stakeholders. Is this the way the system should work? And so we, we want to be on the right but quite often we have to go back to the left to re-explore our source of information and get clarifications or eliminate uh, conflicts between uh, stakeholders or in our requirements themselves. Now at the centre of all this is this green blob called judgment. Now I can't tell you what's in that green blob except I know we use our judgment to make these decisions. So judgment is a very big part of what we do as testers. So this is the story from halfway down the mountain. Now, just as, as an aside, uh, you might be thinking, well, I wonder, do developers explore the same way? I would argue yes. Developers have exactly the same sources of information as the testers if you're working in the same team. So the developers have a goal of creating some software and handing it on for testing. But of course, developers test their own software. So what developers do is they create their own mental models, which they then use to define the behavior of the code. And their shortcoming is that they use the same mental models to derive tests. So their uh, mental models for testing are the same as what they use for development. So they are blind to certain problems. At any rate, I argue that uh, developers and testers have a very similar thought process but with slightly different goals at the end, whether it's to, to test some software or to deliver some code with passing tests. But it's not such a different objective. So let's break it down into the, into the detail. And I'm going to go through this rather quickly, I'm afraid, because of the time I've got. So on the left, I have my sources of knowledge. I inquire, I ask questions, I read, I interview, I discuss and debate with stakeholders. As I explore, I create models and my model appears on the right. When I have my model, I can use that model, when I think I understand, I can use that model to make predictions of the behavior of the system and to test. When I can make predictions, I can use those predictions to challenge my sources. So in the, in the situation where you have a requirement that has ambiguity or gaps, whatever, you can use your current model and your current understanding to create some examples which will drive out these ambiguities, gaps, and so on. So we have this uh, activity on the left challenging, which is asking questions of our sources of information. Do we understand the requirement? Now, you remember, you recall that when I think my model is okay and adequate, I can make progress and I can use that same model to inform my tests. When I come to using those tests to run them, I use the word applying because I didn't want to get bogged down in this idea of executing tests or running tests or using tools or doing it manually. Applying is however I apply those tests using tools, technology or people, I don't care. When I apply those tests, I get an outcome which I can study. When I run a collection of tests, I can interpret. I have to interpret what these test results actually mean. So applying could be done by a tool or a human. Interpreting, certainly for now, is a human activity. Of course, you might find bugs and you might log bugs and then revise the system and so on. The revise the system blob, the red blob there, isn't really part of the model, but I just want to give you some context that you understand that I'm still on the same page. I have to report outcomes to my stakeholders. What do these tests tell us about the state of the system or the product I'm testing? Sometimes I need to refine my model as I learn through testing that my model is inadequate. I have to refine it perhaps. Sometimes I have to go back to the beginning to my sources. So I have to do more exploration and ask questions of my stakeholders. When you glue the whole thing together, the two halves, you get this. It looks like a kind of a crawling insect, which was definitely not the uh, intention. It's just the way it came out. 
Um, if you're interested in what I'm saying now, but in a slightly slower uh, pace, you could look at the BBC talk. I uh, have a link for it there. Search for BBC New Model Testing and you'll find the video. So the whole model end-to-end -end represents a set of thought processes that are connected by decisions that take you from inquiring to modelling to informing to applying and so on. It's not a process where you have procedures, inputs, outputs, entry and exit criteria. It's not that. It's a, it's a, it's a pattern of thinking. Your brain, because of its such remarkable power, might be working on four or five or six of these activities at the very same time. That's how smart our brains are. So with the model as it stands, uh, I want to suggest, OK, what use is it? I want to talk through some, some consequences and just give you an insight as to where my thinking is and how I use the model. The first thing is about skills. There are 10 activities, ING, uh, modeling, inquiring, predicting, challenging capabilities. I speculate that these are the kind of skills that we need in order to conduct meaningful testing, to use our brains to model accurately and to make progress as testers. Now, many of these activities, uh, many of these skills rather, uh, are per perhaps not very familiar to you. So I have like uh, predicate logic and proof. This is part of how, I, how we understand language and take uh, the language itself to come to conclusions, to interpret what language means. Socratic method is essentially about questioning where you know the answers to the questions in order to get other people to follow your uh, line of thought, if you like, to fix requirements. Certainly interpersonal skills are a huge part of the whole uh, gamut of skills that testers need. So uh, this collection of skills is not something you'll see in the certification schemes. And let me explain a little uh, conclusion I came to some time ago. Uh, a friend of mine and myself uh, put together this kind of table of how we thought maybe the uh, skills and career development might proceed based on the thinking of the new model. And what I understand to be on the right is test process management methodology is primarily where the certification schemes focus. If you look at the table of contents for the foundation uh, certificate in ISTQB, you will see that it is almost entirely logistics. The stuff I said I do not care about. And my conclusion is certification schemes will not make you a better tester. Now, there are other consequences as well from the whole idea of the model itself. Uh, I've got uh, new views on how we deal with automation. In particular, test automation, we build automation against different models than the models we use to do the original build of the software, the design of the software, or the testing of that new software. For test design, it's quite clear we need to teach modeling, not procedures. The test design techniques are, pr are procedures using models given to you. You have to have the skills to create your own models and you need tools to support that activity. So there is a whole raft of new tools that we need to look at. With regards to artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning and the test process, well, one of the things I'm doing is I'm working on a prototype uh, pair tester bot, a piece of software to work with me as a substitute for a human in my exploratory testing and my testing in general. And in fact, uh, we need a, a, a kind of a new um, metaphor for testing, uh, for exploration and testing. And I'm beginning to be con uh, convinced that the word surveyor is the word we use, an engineering term. We survey the software and then we test it. Clearly, the whole left side of the new model is focusing on collaboration, on that side of the behavior-driven development uh, ideal, if you think, if you like. Clearly, we need tools to do visualization, reporting that are much more sophisticated than what we have now, based on data, true data. So these are the kind of the conclusions that I've been coming to with the model and the ideas I've got for going forward with it, um, which I'm pretty excited about because I can defend almost uh, all the answers I have to the biggest questions of testing. How much testing is enough? How do I articulate? How do I explain what testing is doing for our stakeholders? And so on. So I'm really quite excited about it, needless to say.
Finally, um, I said that you could get your hands on a copy of uh, the little book I wrote. Uh, CA uh, kindly sponsored the writing of this book. It's my book, but they sponsored it. Um, but they use it uh, as, a, as a, an example uh, to explain what digital is about. So if you're interested in the digital assurance book, uh, Google a digital assurance book and you'll see a link to the CA Technologies website and you can uh, request a, a free copy. With that, I'll say thank you very much and, and hand back to Sabine. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Tune in next week when Mike Talks will tell you more about his favorite infrastructure testing recipes. Tune in at four here at the Agile Testing Days YouTube channel.